Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for May the 1st, 2020. This is episode number four. On today's show, we'll be talking about these headlines. Tesla makes its first ever Q1 profit, but Elon Musk has a meltdown. Lincoln cancels its Rivian-based SUV. Price and EPA range for the Audi e-tron Sportback is revealed. And much, much more. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dominic Kioni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Today we have with us Tom Logney, for longtime EV advocate and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on your all your usual podcast platforms. And finally, we have Kyle Connor from Outer Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together the awesome videos for our new Inside EVs YouTube channel. So go ahead and subscribe and tap that uh, notifications bell. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey, good to see you. Good morning. Oh, all hey, right. Guys. Lots to talk about today. Things just keep coming into as we go. So this is keep going. Uh, so the big news of the week, of course, is Tesla makes a profit. The first quarter results are in, and for the first time ever, in, a, in the first quarter of the year, Tesla has a profit. Uh, big news, Martin. Huge news because Q1 is seasonally, and it's not a Tesla issue. Q1 is seasonally down of course they've had q1 shockers before that those that just did the headline readers who uh, don't uh, don't delve into the reasons why you know it's it's q1's often been a source of negative headlines for tesla to say uh, oh my goodness they didn't uh, produce and deliver uh, enough cars but this really was a q1 with a uh, with a big difference and lots of factors coming into play there model 3 is really up to maturity model y started much earlier than uh, people thought china is uh, around 3,000 cars, Model 3s, per week, and they're looking to get it to 4,000 very soon. By summer, of course, China is all uh, open again and producing, whereas uh, we're still, as we know, uh, facing in other parts of the world uh, stay at home and uh, lockdown or whatever you want to call it. So a really big deal for Q1 with Tesla and lots to shout about as well. So for any Tesla fans, a fantastic result and a small profit for the company as well. Different measures you can make according to profitability and reasons why and, uh, you know, including or not including credits and all those kind of things. But generally a very, very good uh, first quarter is how I saw it. I don't know about you. It was like a $16 million profit, so pretty meager. And you were mentioning the regulatory credits. They, they brought in like $354 million on regulatory credits. Some people think that's a bit of a cheat, but personally, I think, you know, profit is profit. Revenue is revenue. That's, that's stuff that they know is coming. And, you know, as they're, they're still expanding, they're still growing gigafactories. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of outflow to build up future revenue. So that's just kind of how it goes. And you're also mentioning they're lowering costs. The, I was impressed by this. The uh, automotive gross margins are up to 25.5%, which is uh, the highest they've been in quite a while. So that's, that's another good thing. What would you take away from this, Tom? Yeah, no, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, Q1 profit is is excellent to hear, especially when we know the next couple quarters are going to be really trying. Uh, so it was good to get uh, some good news out there um, because we really don't know where we're going, you know, with this whole global shutdown. Uh, I, I, you know, eventually we're going to the wheels are going to start turning. Industry is going to open back up, but uh, you know, it's going to be really difficult to to have profit in the next couple quarters, I believe at least. So. You know, coming out with that surprise, or Tesla was expected to lose about 32 cents a share. Instead, they 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 uh, recorded a profit of about nine cents per share, which is, uh, you know, that's just that's fantastic news. Um, I'm 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 shocked as anybody. Uh, the market was happy to see that, and uh, you know, in China, there's a little bit more. I don't know if you want to call it good news, but. The Chinese uh, government it was supposed to phase out the subsidies for the new energy vehicles in 2020. They just announced that they're going to be extending them for another two years. Uh, and But they, they instituted some limits. Now, you, the most the vehicle could cost was about 300,000 RMB, which U.S. terms, it's about $42,000. Um, all the Model 3s cost a little bit above that. But the standard range plus was only about... $1,500, I think, over that. So Tesla just announced that they lowered the price 
to tuck it in just under that um, subsidy cap. So you will be able to get the Model 3 and get the subsidies in China. And it's a big deal because between what Tesla lowered the price, which was only somewhere about $1,500, um, and the subsidy, it makes a $4,500 difference, which is, you know, uh, more than 10% of the cost of the vehicle. So I think that's important because a lot of their competition in China that's in that luxury segment now no longer will qualify for the subsidy. And that's going to give uh, buyers in China the, that maybe are really stretching their budget to get a Model 3. It's going to give them the incentive to go and get it because they're saving a good chunk of change that they wouldn't sa save on, say, a competitive vehicle. So I think that's going to help China, uh, Tesla in China moving forward. But for China, you know, the globally, uh, Q2, Q3, I think we're looking for some pain um, like we will with all companies. Just briefly, the other, uh, the other big competitor in China for, well, not a huge competitor, but the other significant competitor for Tesla in China is NIO. And they just got a billion dollar thing. And their vehicles, although they're priced higher, they're also avail they're also eligible for that subsidy because they, the body, the uh, battery swapping arrangement they have. Like, there's some, exactly. Some, I, I actually right. wrote the article on that, and I was incorrectly. My original version of the article said that they wouldn't qualify, and then I realized that they qualify because they have the battery swap. So I went back in and edited that article. So if anybody were to read it uh, in the first couple hours it was out, it said that NEO didn't qualify. It was my bad. I got corrected from some of my contacts in China. Um, the original uh, Chinese subsidy uh, uh, article that I got didn't specify, didn't carve out that battery swap allows you to sell the car for any price. But when I got the full length of report, I saw that it was tucked in there. So NEO will be able to uh, have full subsidies on all their vehicles, regardless of price. And they are definitely a Tesla competitor because in China, NEO is considered really a premium brand. Uh, all of their vehicles cost uh, more than the 300,000 uh, RMB uh, subsidy cap. So, so back to the Tesla. So the day after their, their big Q1 profit, Elon Musk is trending number one on Twitter, not because of the profit, not because of all the success that they saw, but because during the, after, after the Q1, uh, uh, financials are released, they have a, a monthly or a quarterly call with different analysts and they take questions and they, you know, give more depth, uh, more details on what's going on with the company. And, you know, he, he had a little bit of a rant. We are a bit worried about not being able to resume production um, in the Bay Area, and, and that should be identified as a serious risk. Um, that, you know, that we, we, we only have two car factories right now, one in Shanghai and one in mm -hmm. the Bay Area. And the Bay Area produces the vast majority of our cars. Uh, all of S and X, um, uh, uh, and, and most of the three, and all of the Y. So, um, the, the the extension of the shelter in place, uh, or frankly, I would call it forcibly imprisoning people in their homes uh, against all their constitutional rights. That, that my opinion, and breaking people's freedoms in ways that are horrible and, and, and wrong, uh, and not why people came to America or built this country. What the f Excuse me. Woo! Dropping the F-bomb. Wow. Hey. Oh, man. So, I don't know how y'all feel about this, but, you know, I, I thought it was unfortunate because it just takes, you know, it takes a spotlight of what they're accomplishing and, you know, I can understand his frustration because we're all frustrated. We're all stuck up. Well, we're not stuck in our houses. There's not like guards at the doors. You know, people can go outside for walks and things, but like in, in the Bay area where, where he is, you know, he wants to get back to work and they just extended the, the lockdown to the end of May, which is another four weeks from now. So the, the frustration is understandable, but yeah. You have an opinion about this, Kyle? Well, I, I tend to agree with you, which is, um, I don't really see a place for it on an earnings call. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to pretend I'm an industry analyst. I'm not, you know, not going to make predictions or of what he should or shouldn't do. Uh, but it just, like you mentioned, took away from all the accomplishments of just even earning a profit 
in Q1. So yeah, I, I thought it wasn't the place for it. Um, certainly agree uh, that everyone can can feel different ways about this. I mean, uh, uh, I, I see where he's coming from. I see where everyone else is coming from. I get both sides of the picture, but uh, yeah, no place for it on an earnings call. Tom, did you, did, did you catch that live? Yeah, and I agree with Kyle. Um, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Everyone can speak their own mind. But when you are the, the head of a large company like that, words matter. Um, it wasn't appropriate to bring that up on the earnings call, number one. But, you know, take that aside. Even if you were to say that outside of the earnings call, nobody in America is forcibly imprisoned in their homes, which he said. That's right. just flat out wrong. There were areas of China where they did that when, it, when this outbreak originally came out, where people were literally barred in their apartments. Bars were put over their doors and they were not allowed to leave their apartments. They had guards set up and, and that, that's forcibly imprisoning people in their homes. So, you know, for Elon to come out and, and really um, massage the truth, if you want to call it like that, I think it's inappropriate. I think it's reckless. And, um, you know, I, I, I understand why a lot of people are upset about it. Yeah, I don't see any upside to bring this, bringing it up on the call at all. And he, he went on to make another statement a little bit later, calling it fascist, which is kind of beyond the pale. And he has a bit of a, uh, how do you say, libertarian streak, I think, if you look at his ideas for governance on, on Mars which is, you know, whatever, <laughs> however <laughs> likely that is going to happen. But, uh, you know, he, he likes the direct, the idea of direct democracy more than, say, representative democracy. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> it was just, just unfortunate that, you know, that's kind of, I mean, I heard that and, then, you know, that's all people talked about. After that. We didn't hear it, hardly any of the questions or there was no, you know, all the focus was lost. And, you mm -hmm. know, a couple other upsides actually we should mention, um, the solar solar roof production is uh, is going well. I guess they have they've hit as many as a, a thousand homes worth of of produ production, and uh, also their energy storage uh, business uh, is going well. I guess they have some big orders in the pipeline that's uh, bigger than than their biggest one, which is the biggest one in the world, I believe, in, in Hornsby, Australia. So that's another good thing. So, uh, but anyway, so putting that aside, Tesla also this week, their um, autopilot traffic light and stoplight control beta was released for uh, full self-driving people. And two of you have Teslas, but do you have full self-driving? So I don't have the full self-driving option, so I wouldn't get this update. Um, you know, and quite honestly, I, I, I wouldn't rely on it yet. Uh, that's just my opinion. I don't have any facts on that, but mm -hmm. that'd be a little scary for me to, to, to really rely on, on, on that feature because I mean, even as, and I love autopilot, it's one of my favorite things. It makes a lot of mistakes, you right. know? So, you know, it, it's a little bit different on the highway when I'm cruising around and, um, and I can, I have time to react. When you're coming into an intersection and, you know, there's a stop sign, you're, you know, three feet from entering the, the intersection when, the, when you reach the stop sign. If it just decides to keep going, you wouldn't even have time to react before you're in an accident. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm all for it. This is, this, this is just another phase in, in getting to full autonomy. We're going to have to go through this. There's going to be this awkward period where there's technology released and it's not quite ready yet. And uh, overall, it's going to save lives, but um, I, I don't want to be a beta tester of this at all. <laughs> How about you, Kyle? Well, um, so I, I actually like doing the beta testing stuff. Um, you know, if my life is on the line, it's exciting. No, uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> basically the way the system works, uh, it, I think it's designed in a way to help avoid some of the scenarios that you're talking about. It's certainly possible. But what it does, like we see in the video here, is it will slow down for every single intersection that the car has programmed in, whether right. it can see the lights or not. Green or red. You have to over and over confirm that the light is green 
and then the car will pick up speed again. You can do that either by pressing the autopilot stock or in the case of Model 3, the gear lever or tapping the accelerator pedal. Um, so do I want to sit in traffic and constantly tell the car it's okay to go? No, that makes autopilot less convenient than just putting it on traffic aware cruise control and hitting the brakes when I see a red light. Um, that's how I drive in the city now. I, I think it is uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, not too unsafe. The, the two main concerns that I, I see with this are the car uh, slowing down for intersections that are green, driver not paying attention and ending up sitting stopped at a green light, potential rear ending uh, situation. The second would be it not knowing there's an intersection there, such as a new traffic light or a glitch in the system, driver's not paying attention and it blows through a red light. Uh, I had heard in early access cars that it did not see every intersection with the uh, full release to FSD owners. I have not heard of that complaint yet, but look, you know, it just takes one of these things to uh, go. So, so as with anything, if you're doing this, always pay attention when you're using autopilot. It is not self-driving. It is purely driver assistance. And uh, just keep that in mind when you're using this system. You're, you're reading my notes here, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me just circle back to it. That What Kyle mentioned, I think, is, is probably the best and most important point, is that if you're going to be using the autopilot features, any of the features today, the, 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 the features that had been released or these new features, you have to pay attention and constantly be vigilant. But we see too many people not doing that. And that's a problem. We see people sleeping in their cars on highways and... I, I, I'm concerned we'll get to the point where this new rollout, where people will have enough confidence in it, where they'll stop paying attention. That's the problem. Um, I know it's like I said, it's just another step. We have to go through it. I just don't want to be one of the people that's going through that step. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm glad it's released and it's only going to make the system smarter. Um, just please, if you're if you're watching this video, pay attention if you have the autopilot software in action, especially this new, the, the, the new features. Be vigilant and, and, you, and you should be okay. But too often we see people not doing that and that's the problem. Since we're on the topic, I kind of want to ask you guys, I was on a, uh, like a Zoom conference last night with our local North Carolina Tesla Owners Club. And uh, I really sat back and just listened to, you know, I really was interested to see what people are talking about as a whole from Tesla owners. And the, the number one topic throughout the entire hour long, hour and a half long conference was um, first, is everyone getting their AP 3.0 computer upgrade, which honestly doesn't make a huge difference. And two um, was this traffic light situation and how people use autopilot. And I've learned that people are using autopilot in ways they definitely should not and they don't understand the system as a whole. I mean, people are like, well, I can't do really sharp corners in my neighborhood on autopilot. Well, it's like, it's not designed for that. If you're going to use it, it's purely to see what the car can do. And you're there to take over. Like I use autopilot in every situation I shouldn't, but it's purely just to test the car and I'm there to take over. These people are doing it, but they're just expecting the car to drive itself. Have you seen this as a whole in the community, Dominic, especially because you're on the forum, the Inside EVs forum all the time? Yeah, our our uh, Tesla community isn't isn't huge on, on the forum. We have like a, a few. We have like Clarity Plug-in Hybrid owners, and we have a lot of uh, uh, Hyundai Kona Electric and Kia Niro EV owners. Um, so we don't have a lot, whole lot of Tesla owners talking about their experience on our forum. But in other places, I haven't seen quite that level of unawareness. But uh, yeah. A lot, a lot of times, though, in, in uh, we, we get trapped in this bubble. We we see a lot of Tesla fans online and in, in comments, and you know these people are are pretty educated about how the system works, how it's supposed to work, and you know so we don't hear about misuse or misunderstanding so much until maybe there's a, a video that shows up with an accident or something. Yeah, I think is, that's where that that gap was bridged as we interact with a lot of you know, high IQ Tesla owners, uh, enthusiasts, et cetera. Um, this was much more of like the normal ownership base. Right. And it jumped on for a QA and a call. I just thought it was uh, so interesting. It was a shock to me. But in, in spite of that, this, so this morning, um, Tesla released their uh, autopilot accident ratio or accident report. So basically in the quarter, first quarter of 2020, 
there it scored its lowest accident ratio ever. So with autopilot off and safety features off, it had one accident for every 1.42 million miles, which is which is up from up 13 percent for whatever reason. I don't know. And also with autopilot off again, but but with safety features activated, uh, it had one accident for every 1.99 million miles. That's that was also up 13 percent. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. But with autopilot on, one accident for every 4.68 million miles, which is like a, a little more than two times better than with the off with the safety features on, and that's up 63 percent year over year. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, this is an interesting chart. And maybe Tom or Martin, you guys would understand better than I would. But I would imagine in most cases with autopilot on, you're on a highway. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I don't know if there are more or less accidents on a highway than surface streets. I would imagine less. So I wonder if we looked at actual highway mileage accidents versus autopilot on highway accidents if that would be more of an apples to apples comparison. What are your uh, thoughts on this? Um, I'll just jump in and uh, and I coincidentally read something recently about how the uh, current stay at home situation is uh, saving the state of California. It was almost tens of millions of dollars a day equivalent in terms of highway accidents um, uh, responses so because highway accidents tend to cost so much more than a local um, yeah, fender bender uh, an intersection at 10 miles an hour if actually if you have an accident on the highway it tends to be a lot more serious and because of the current uh, stay at home situation less traffic on the roads and and the article was really about the the, the the money that's being saved by by just not having to to deal with so much traffic in in California I think maybe it was Los Angeles specifically and so uh, that would back up exactly what you're saying which is actually the severity of uh, of accidents can be so much more uh, worse on a, on a highway and actually if you've got some technology that works very well on highways then uh, the the potential for that system is so much greater. I would say though that actually what is sometimes forgotten perhaps in this discussion is the the very short with 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 autopilot the very short distance between the first time you try it which is uh, a, uh, a a real moment of right take my hands off the wheel what on earth is going to happen here and uh, I'm sure everyone's had their own version of that from uh, from being like oh this is okay to sheer blind panic terror of is this going to keep me on the road i think it's a very short distance between that and trusting the system because the system is so good when it works and so i totally understand the people that you were talking about which was actually you can on highways you can learn to trust tesla autopilot so much because it works so well uh, that you can become complacent and that is uh, a nice problem to have for for a system that works pretty well because it's reliable and uh, I absolutely think it's fantastic in those situations. For driving around town, as you say, with intersections and having to confirm every junction, it's just a massive pain and uh, it's just far easier for for human pilot to, to take over in those in those situations. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, in other news, moving along, um, so Lincoln uh, and Rivian had an agreement where Ford would um, make a, a new vehicle based on the Rivian platform, and that is cancelled, which is not great. Apparently, they're considering an alternative model. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Tom, did you read about this? Yeah, and uh, if you remember last week on a, on our podcast, we talked about how the you know COVID nineteen disruption might um, change manufacturers' plans. And I I know one of the things we brought up because it was written quite um, often by a bunch of different sites was that this might give the manufacturers an opportunity to shift to their uh, newer platforms uh, to abandon some of their old gas cars move towards um, plug-in vehicles. Uh, and and I had mentioned that I think the opposite is going to happen, that I think the, especially the U.S. manufacturers, they're going to go back to their roots and try to be as profitable as possible coming out of this. And what makes the most profit for them are those big, giant pickup trucks and SUVs. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
I think this is a sign of that. I think uh, Ford is saying, you know what, we're, we're in for some pain now for the foreseeable future. And we need to cut some of the programs that we don't think are going to be highly profitable. And we need to focus on what we make money on. And that's F-150s, that's expeditions, that's Lincoln Navigators, and, uh, and, and they're shifting to that. That's my take on it, at least. I, I wish it weren't true, but I think that's what we're seeing here with this uh, announcement. Yeah, I wrote a little bit about, about this on our, our Rivian chat forum. And so we have a, a separate forum besides the Inside EVs forum it, called Rivian Chat, which is based, it was just for Rivian. And I don't think this is a big, huge deal for Rivian in that they ha already have their own product schedule and they have like, this huge order from Amazon. They have a lot on their plate already, so it, it's not going to hurt them in the in the near term. But I'm worried about what it does for Ford's electrification efforts. Have you have you looked at this at all, Kyle? Yeah, I, I read the story. I, I thought Inside EVs covered it really well, actually. But, um, I, I, you know, one hand is, does Lincoln need Rivian's technology? Uh, or, it, you know, they, their alternative is just to source it from inside Ford. And if the Mach-E is any indication, that's not going to be a bad thing. I mean, it's still going to be a really cool SUV if they use internal technology. Uh, so I, I guess I really don't have a huge problem with it. I think Rivian is certainly going to be like up there for me. I mean, I'm a huge uh, fanboy of Rivian. I think they're great, but um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it means much to uh, Lincoln. I think the products are going to end up being uh, relatively similar to the end user. That's just my prediction. I think it, I think it would smart, be smarter for for Lincoln to use the Mach E for a vehicle rather than the Rivian platform to begin with, just because it's it's in house. But I would like to I don't want them just like to rebadge the Mach E. I want to see you know a totally different body work, maybe just a, a whole different uh, use that same bottom platform and motors and and batteries and inverter and whatever. But yeah, because the the tech in the Mach E is really good. I mean, at least just in in my time with it. I think I mentioned on the last show I got to spend some time with the chief engineer uh, when I was in L.A. at Automobility, and they really you know did as much effort, time, research into this drivetrain as possible. Um, so on one hand, if you're internal Ford, why would you let that go to waste more or less, or why wouldn't you exploit that as much as possible? Uh, maybe put it into like a Lincoln Aviator type size vehicle which is not the big full-size navigator but the step down and yeah i think that would be a good option tom you you probably could predict do you think uh lincoln will take this scat uh skateboard chassis shove it in underneath one of their existing bodies or will they design a full new vehicle around it or just rebadge a mach e yeah so i, I honestly i i don't want to say yes or no i'd love to chat with a ford engineer to see how applicable that would be you you, you know even the smaller suvs uh, it, it, it might, it just might not work in that. It's not, you know, as well, you know, it's, it's not as simple as I think a lot of people just think, Oh, great. We have this platform. We can make a whole bunch of vehicles on it. It's true. But sometimes you end up having to modify the platform so much to make it work that you should have just started from scratch in the beginning and, and circling back to the Rivian deal. I don't think that this is going to hurt Ford's long-term plans of electrification. I don't think so at all. Ford knows they can develop their own platforms in-house. But what I think, the reason why they made this deal with Rivian is because they wanted to get something out now. They wanted to get, get their trucks out quickly, realizing that they had fallen behind. And, and, and they still, you know, parallel, they were working on their own platforms for future trucks and whatnot. So I think what the COVID-19 crisis did was tell, say, look, those immediate plans to rush to market with this Rivian-based product, we, we, can't, we can't do that. It, it's, it's, just, it's not a smart business decision for us right now. We need to make money and we'll continue you know, uh, developing our own in-house platform. So I don't think it's going to affect Ford and Lincoln's long-term electrification plans, but, but it definitely is going to affect their short-term, in, in my opinion. Martin, do you have thoughts on this? What is the... Um view with you guys on Ford and where they are generally in EVs because Ford to me Ford seem uh, not muddled but less clear than I would love because one minute they'll say we're developing our own EVs uh, we've got a great team and we're full steam ahead the next minute we're licensing VW's MEB platform the next minute 
We've done a deal with Rivian and we're an investor. Is it just me or is Ford throwing, you know, lots of things at the wall and seeing what sticks? Or is it because Ford is such a big company, for instance, not all their models are sold in every territory. So maybe in Europe, they want to build some cars based on Vauxhall, uh, VW's platform, but maybe the trucks, which we won't get a, a, a Rivian, or are they hedging their bets? To me, it just seems like they, they're just throwing everything at it and seeing what sticks. Is that unfair? Yeah, I, I think they're taking the, the second approach you had, which is they need a full vehicle portfolio globally. And so to use Rivian's technology to power a uh, future Mustang, you know, sports car electric doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, and same for a family hatchback, which we won't get a hatchback version here. Like we're not getting the new Focus or Fiesta anymore, I don't think. So that's all very popular in Europe. So I think that's what they're doing. They're taking, uh, you know, the best existing technology they can get their hands on. They'll produce it um, and then they'll have their own in-house stuff. But I would say from the consumer's perspective, I, I was at the, and Tom, you were there as well at the Frankfurt Auto Show this year. You go to the Ford booth, they're the only ones that don't have a vehicle with a plug. But then you go across the hall outside and they have this giant building, which is all about their plans for future electrification, like a full display about the future of Ford. And they don't have one vehicle there with a plug. This is before Mach-E was unveiled. And it was kind of like, well, what, what, what are you guys doing? I mean, why would you say you're doing all this effort into electrification but not doing it so my point of view they sort of skipped the compliance car phase of evs i mean certainly they had the c max and the focus electric um, but those were really small numbers a lot of legacy manufacturers created like a sonic ev and then a bolt ev the bolt's a pretty good effort but um you know, Ford just didn't do that. They're like, if we're going to make an electric car true from the ground up, we're going to make it as good as possible. And I believe that's the Mach-E. And I think it is as good as they could possibly make it. So, yeah, I, I see your point, but I, I actually think they just kind of skipped the the crappy EVs more or less, and they're just trying to make it as good as they can, my point of view. So I like I like the way that the VW did it. They have a, and NGM is doing it with a very flexible platform that they can use for a variety of vehicles and sizes and configurations. So whereas Ford is like a, a scattergun approach, they have like the Mach-E, they have the MEB based MEB based vehicles coming from uh, Volkswagen. Their electric F one fifty they're going to be doing, I believe, is built on the gas version of the truck. So it's not a, even on its own platform. And then they have like the Ford Transit Electric that's going to be produced in the U.S. coming soon. But I'm not sure. I don't know if that's an electric only platform at all. Or I, I feel like it's probably going to be like another conversion style situation like the F-150. And they also have like a two-ton Ford uh, Transit plug-in hybrid as well. So it's, yeah, I, I think they could do more with the... Must like I'd like to see a couple of different Ford vehicles uh, on the on the Mach-E platform, like the more sports oriented uh, version. But they, I'd like to see something maybe more family oriented, maybe tone down the the, the output or something. And then uh, for the, the Lincoln Mach-E version, they could sell that in Europe under the Ford label as well. I think, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so, I, to say to say Ford's you know outward electrification vision is schizophrenic would be uh, definitely a, a, a understatement. They they definitely communicate one thing, do another thing, uh, but that's a lot of companies have done that. Remember, I mean, Audi was probably the the most popular. It seemed like every week we had a new Audi e-tron version that was coming out for years, and and we got nothing for years. So it, it's really hard to say what their 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 plans are. I mean, the, the Mach-E started out as a compliance vehicle. Uh, it wasn't going to be the Mustang Mach-E. For, they were a year or two into development, and it was just a boring, like, crossover. And right. um, uh, at some point, they just decided that, you know, the electrification was going faster than, than, than they had thought it would be. So they scrapped it and, and, and turned the vehicle into uh, an exciting, high-performance uh, all electric crossover. So, you know, even up until a couple of years ago, they, they weren't uh, planning on making a compelling electric vehicle. It was still all about compliance. I mean, they, they came right out and admitted that at the uh, Mach-E launch that this started life as a compliance car. So, you know, it's, 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 it's tough to really 
see where, 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 where their vision is right now. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not smart enough to look into what they've been doing, telegraphing and, and understand where they are. Are they still half into it? Do they still want to license technology from everybody else because they don't want to make the investment? Uh, it's, 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 it's tough to, to really analyze where Ford is with electrification. It's a great looking vehicle, though. I'm just looking at the pictures that's going by. Oh, yeah. I think it's, it's pretty nice. Yeah. You mentioned the the Audi e-tron, and uh, they just had the, the Audi e-tron Sportback is coming, and they just released the price for the U.S. and the EPA rated range. Have you seen that? Yeah, well, this is such a German thing here, right? It's let's take our very practical, nice looking SUV, and then we'll make it less practical, cost more, look more ugly, and uh, charge you more for it. So th everyone does, I mean, this is like BMW X5, X6, Cayenne, regular and Cayenne Coupe, now Audi with this, to be expected. Um, yeah, it goes a little bit farther on a charge, probably for aero. I don't think the mechanicals are any different. I know it uses 91% of its 95 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but those are the numbers off the top of my head. The regular e-tron also does that with a software update uh, that was not over the air, although it is capable of over the air updates. And um, yeah, I just, uh, personal opinion, I think it's silly. I can't put the dogs in it. I think it looks really ugly. What do you guys think? <laughs> I, I, I like the, I think this is the, the sexy e-tron. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I, I prefer, and I've, I've sat in the back actually, and maybe I don't know about the back, the very back for the dogs, but at least in the in the back passenger side, the roof is kind of like hollowed out a bit, so there's like all, all kinds of I'm six right, the helmet space. Yeah, I'm like six <laughs> two. I had lots of room back there for my head and moving around. I thought it was great. So just to just to hit the price point for a second, it's a seventy seven thousand dollar seventy seven thousand four hundred dollars uh, manufacturer suggested retail price, and that's uh, twenty six hundred dollars more than than the than the SUV version, the straight straight back roof version, <laughs> um, and it gets 14 miles more range, so it's up to 218 miles of EPA range. Do we know how well that does on in actual, like in, in real world range? Have we driven that at all? The regular one's not too far off of what they say. Tom, have you driven the Sport back yet? I actually have driven in the Sport back for about two hours. I wasn't allowed to drive it. Uh, I don't remember if it was at the LA Auto Show or at CES. I know it was uh, within the last couple of months when, when they had just brought it out. Uh, and I, I like the vehicle. I would prefer that over the regular e-tron. If, if, if I were to buy one of these two, um, I would much prefer the Sportback. It, hand, it drove so much better than the e-tron. Really drove more like a, like a sports uh, sedan than, than an SUV. Uh, and I don't need the uh, the extra room that the e-tron uh, you know SUV has. I don't have big dogs like you, Kyle. So that that would actually work better for me. It can still tow. I think up to four thousand pounds. Goes zero to sixty in something like five point seven seconds. Uh, it's a good performer, but the price is just it's just too high. You know, if if that would have come in at say seven thousand less than the 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 the, the initial e-tron. I think it would have been a lot more compelling. It's just even with subsidies and everything now, it's it's priced, I think, a little bit out of its range where it should be. Uh, but I like the vehicle. I just don't like the price. It is a bit it is a bit high compared to the Model Y. Do you know what the, the Model Y is around 50 something, Martin? Yeah. And uh, it's a big decision to make of what kind of car do you want? And it's what, I'll, uh, you know, when people ask advice and all those kind of things, what kind of car do you want? Do you want something that is that single screen experience where you are, you are, you are doing, you know, the Tesla thing? Are you going to go for that? Or do you want something that feels like every other car you've driven? If you're in the market for a 60, 70, 80,000 pound euro dollar car, do you want that experience that you've had before? Because honestly, sitting inside any of the Audi, the e-tron, Mercedes-Benz EQC, Jaguar I-Pace, just luxurious places to be inside. And they really do wipe the floor in terms of build quality, the cliche of slamming the door. It is just a different kind of thud. I'm sorry to say it, but they just make the cars better. But it's full of 
buttons and switches and knobs and dials and there's a, fa a thousand different things to do. Uh, it's just, it, I don't think this is about the price because I think when you get into that league, it's less about can I afford it and you know can I afford the payments or is this going to be a company car and it's more about what kind of car do I want. And honestly, if you want a kind of car that you've driven before, a luxurious high-end German car, you cannot go wrong with this Audi e-tron. The Sportback just looks beautiful and... It's it just it's a it's a stunning car, but it's hella expensive for what you get. Which, as Kyle says, you know, a big battery and a lot less usable, you know, uh, for 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 what's on it. And that's how they manage to make those claims of our car will charge at uh, you know the, the the taper off doesn't start till you get to the end of your charge, and you can charge really quickly and get back on the road. Well because there's yeah, so that's, much more you can't use up there. Yeah, like that's, <laughs> that's true, but yeah. also, like, if you had access to the whole battery and you need to take a comfort break or a stop and you don't care that the charge rate has gone down from 150 to 50, 40 or 50 or even, you know, 20 if it's topping off, just give, give me access to all the battery. So... You know, di very different beasts. Uh, I'm always wary of, of comparing a Tesla Model Y or a, you know, a Tesla to anything else. Yeah, they are. And, and it sounds like it's great. They make two different versions because as much as you guys love the Sportback, I hate it. So <laughs> <laughs> that's that's perfect. I, I love the full e-tron. I'm a huge fan. Uh, Tom, you were talking to my girlfriend, Alyssa, about this when you were here. I mean, the e-tron's her dream car, right? She has an i3. She's spent time with Model Y. She's like, I don't care about the range. It's e-tron or nothing, baby. So that's the way it's going to have to happen for us. But I'll wait for a certified one in a couple of years when they've depreciated like a rock. Yeah, yeah. But and also, why call it, and I don't know, I could Google this, I suppose, but why is it called the 50 and the 55? Because it bears um, no relation. Is is it that it's not the battery size? What is no, it? it? I think it's supposed to be equivalent to the gas car performance numbering scheme. So like Audi has oh, uh, okay. like the a 8 4.0 or 40 or 50. I mean, I think it's supposed to fall into however they number their vehicles. That shows how little attention I pay to Audi's fossil cars. So that makes sense if it lines up with their, their combustion range. But again, that comes back to the point of if you want a car that you can transition to because you used to have, I don't know, a BMW X5 and you're used to being in those, it's a very analogous ex uh, experience to go to this, apart from, of course, all the electric stuff. And that's why I give Ford a lot of credit for the Mach-E, because they went out there and really copied Tesla with the interior layout and the touchscreen. And that's fine. I, I don't think Tesla minds that. They, Ford recognized that what they do in their regular line and brands is, is maybe doesn't translate to this new vehicle, this new electric vehicle. So we're going to copy kind of what, what the best of this new uh, this new type of vehicle is, which is Tesla. All the other brands are simply taking their existing lines and kind of changing the powertrain and making little changes here and there. And because they believe that their customers are used to their products and they don't want this big radical change. Uh, and that's why the Audi, when you get in it, same with the Mercedes uh, EQC, uh, when you get in it, it just looks like an Audi or a Mercedes. Everything is the same. Um, and I, I kind of give Ford credit for saying, you know what, this is a different type of vehicle. This is a different mentality. And we're, 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 we're going to take a look at who's succeeding in this. And we're, we're going to emulate that. So uh, I give Ford a lot of credit for the interior design of the Mach-E because they, they didn't just make it look like a Ford. You get in that car and, and remove the, the, the Mustang badging or whatever, you could never tell me you were sitting in a Ford. And, and, and I like that. I think that they went outside of the box, something that the other existing OEMs aren't willing to do. Right. Uh, speaking of OEMs not going outside of the box or staying inside the box, the uh, BMW iX3 leaked online this week and in what appears to be full production form. And have you seen this, Martin? <laughs> this is just a BMW <laughs> X3. And uh, yeah, being made in China. Uh, let's bring up a picture of it. There we go. And uh, yeah, that is, uh, that's exactly what you ex would expect from a big BMW. Okay, they've put some blue bits on it. <laughs> and uh, they've put some accents on. But apart from that, look, it's a BMW X3. And uh, it's, that's, that's exactly what it is. Um, it looks, look, it looks nice. It's, it's, 
it is what it is. It's got the it's got the crazy big, not the stupid big, but it's got the crazy big uh, kidney grill on it. And it's just if you like that, if that's what you go for, get one of these because it's going to be a great car. And uh, yeah, like I say, made in made in China, only made in China, and exported everywhere else um, except no, the US. No, well, yeah, uh, that's not a problem for me. I don't mind where my cars are made. I think, you know, generally everyone's making pretty solid cars these days. So I don't mind who puts the thing together. Um, it looks look, it looks nice. And it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful car. It's exactly what you would expect it to look like. They've, they've done the like, hey, look, we've we've got a diffuser and we've put we've made it blue. It's <laughs> it's electric and it's sporty. So, yeah, it's um, ah, it's, look, it's a nice car. And um, hopefully because the X3, remember as well, the X3. Is such a pillar of BMW's lineup. Again, not that I know a huge amount about. I don't follow combustion cars as closely as uh, some of you guys, but it's a big deal for BMW, and they, they it's need the, this. The volume seller. I mean, the three series has been phased out in favor for X3, um, and you know, in, in the U.S., like eighty percent or some crazy number are leased. So it'll be really interesting uh, to see in Europe and China and other markets how this vehicle is is purchased by people. Will they? most likely go and lease them or own them will we mm. see an i3 type scenario by the way this is the first full ev from bmw uh since the i3 is that true is it six years now something like this i don't think the mini e was really it uh the, the yeah. se the cooper se but that's you know not under the bmw nameplate um yeah i i mean i'm excited for them to finally make something that's electric i'm bummed it's not going to come here mm -hmm. and uh i i really think it would be a great option but it doesn't seem like it's moving the bar forwards in any way whatsoever yeah i don't think it i don't know how well, well it would compete here you know i don't think it, you know, like you say this looks like it's on the it's on the x3 platform basically the chinese x3 platform and uh, isn't it a, a case that people only want SUVs. Why? Why wouldn't it? So, sorry, this isn't an SUV. This is an SAV. They go at uh, great lengths to describe it as a sports activity. They've done vehicle. that for years since the first <laughs> X5. They've been trying this. It's an SAV. That's not yeah. catching on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been but why wouldn't this? Why wouldn't now? this sell really done. well in the US? Uh, range. Yeah, let's see. Seventy-four. Uh, Seventy-four kilowatt hour usable. Right, which is. <laughs> Was going to be what? It will yeah, hit like the Polestar 200. 2 usable. Will yeah. it hit 200 right. miles, maybe? I don't know. And when you're in a premium market, people expect premium range, you know? you got to get over 200 miles. I'll That's tell you how, if this car came to the U.S., this is exactly the people who would buy it. It is, hello, your current X3 is off lease. Would you like another one? Okay. And let me show <laughs> you. You can plug this one in. Have a nice day. It would purely go to, to BMW customers. It would not attract right. a new audience to the brand. Um, it's not going to take away from Tesla's sales. But it would be like, let's say my grandmother has had five X5s or X3s in a row. Now she drives around town. Doesn't you know? It's just going to be the the next leased car for the family. And I, I think it would be a great idea to have it here. I'm kind of bummed we're not getting it because I'm such a BMW fan. Well, VW think the ID4 is going to sell, so that's that's you're not you're not getting the ID3, but you get the ID4, and that is a right. slightly smaller, I think, SUV. And that, that we we saw that actually pretty much uh, without any camo too. I think this morning or, or yesterday we have a picture of that. You know, I think the the ID4 is going to do well here as long as Volkswagen keeps the price down, and there's every indication that they're they're going to do that. That they're really trying to make this mass market car um and uh, i'm excited i'm looking forward to it i love how in the spy shots they always try and make them look like uh opals or voxels they always try and put a little fake <laughs> front on or like oh this is the new grandland x or something and then like yeah. no it's just a vw stop stop trying to do that we know what you're doing that's the extent of their camouflage they put it like the opal tag on the front and that yeah, was it. that's it are those fake fake exhaust pipes in the back Oh, let's have a look. They're yeah, they'll put the they'll... gas cars too, though. I just want to point this out. It, That's look true. at the back of any Audi Q, whatever. They have the little cutouts, and you, they're literally plastic, and the exhaust pipe is dumped in front of the rear bumper. It drives me nuts. I hate yeah. that. <laughs> if you get your head down there and have a look underneath, or just if it's a smoky diesel, and you're like, hang on a minute, there's just a pipe coming yeah. out, <laughs> out of the back. It's like, like back in the day, they used to have, instead of having a dual exhaust, they would take your single exhaust pipe and put a Y at the very end of the car, so you have two 
exhaust nice. tips coming it's in the back, but it, it, it's, uh, there's no advantage to it at all. <laughs> this is purely aesthetic. But speaking uh, of cars, Tom and I have some vehicles. I don't know if you really want to talk about it too much, but Tom, don't you have the new Leaf or you're getting it for a loan? Yeah, I just got uh, two days ago the the Leaf Plus 2020 Leaf Plus for a two week period, going to be doing some testing with it, definitely a, a full on range test and uh, uh, just general driving reviews. And, uh, you know, so look forward to those uh, reviews up on Inside EVs. And Kyle, I understand you just got a vehicle dropped off for your use for a little while also. Yeah, I got two. I have uh, the new Bolt EV. Uh, I have that for two weeks. Uh, it's the 2020, I think a six kilowatt hour larger battery pack. Honestly, it's kind of been parked in the driveway because I also got the new Volvo V60 T8 Polestar, um, which is like oh, one of my favorite cars on the planet. I've been dreaming about this thing. It has, it's basically a sound system strapped to 415 horsepower <laughs> plug-in hybrid. Uh, this Bowers and Wilkins 1200 watt, 1100 watt, 15 speaker stereo will make your ears bleed. It sounds incredible. No distortion turned up. And uh, so the whole way up, you know, I had an hour and a half driving it this morning. I just had the stereo pegged at 11 and it was incredible. Um, but also I thought it was pretty interesting. I drove like almost 28 miles all electric on the highway pretty much before the gas engine turned on yeah, and so um, what speed were you do? it goes up to highway speeds like 78 70, it kicks over to gas yeah so i had it at 76 on pilot assist so it you know it does all the driving for you yeah. and uh I, i'm such a volvo fan and so you give me a fast volvo wagon that's special it's got massive brakes fully adjustable olin suspension i'm going to take it out on track later today but I launched it nice. last night, spun all four tires. Like, it's <laughs> great. It is really, I've never been happier in a car. I think I'm going to have to buy one at some point. <laughs> when you hammer it like that from, for launching, does the, uh, does the uh, combustion motor kick in? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So okay. the way it works is it's 330 horsepower. So turbocharged and supercharged direct injected four cylinder on the front axle. And then the rear axle is your. Uh, 10 kilowatt hour electric motor that'll do, I think, 70 or 80 kilowatt, maybe more. Right. Something okay. like 100 horsepower. And um, But what's amazing is it's tuned with the Polestar stuff to feel as rear biased as possible. So if you stick it into a corner and floor it, even though there's so much more power up front, they've done some trickery somehow to not make it understeer like a truck. Mm. It's really... Uh, super impressive. I've only put about 150 miles on it. Most of were this morning, but um, yeah, I, I honestly haven't smiled more in a car <laughs> than this because it's just super premium. You can do all your stuff electric and it's one of the few plug-in hybrids that use the electric portion for more performance mm. rather than more efficiency. I wonder how this will stack up against something like the Polestar 3. Is Polestar 3 the crossover? We haven't seen it yet. Yeah, not I'm not sure. no. There's been there's been plenty of renders, and occasionally one of those renders is found by a blog, and there's a story, you know, uh, I Polestar three revealed. It's like no, uh, right. that's it's, it's, there's nothing, you know, nothing official. But obviously, we know it's they've it's officially talked about, and um, uh, that will be, uh, and uh, you know, so when it, when you say the, the the Polestar version, that is the Kyle, that's like the engineering. So they tweak it. So they do the shocks and yeah, dampers. Yeah, like all those AMG or internal M. Right. Okay. And so, they, which is kind of confusing because uh, so all fast Volvos in the past were always badged R. So you had the 850R, et cetera. Right. And now it's uh, Polestar. It's uh, Polestar Engineer. Yeah. <laughs> and so Polestar Engineered is like the new R, but Polestar itself is also its own company under the Geely umbrella of Volvo. And um, yeah, it's kind of confusing. Either way, I don't care what they call it. The thing's pretty badass. It's great. Cool. Cool. Yeah, it's nice. We also saw this week the uh, Lucid Motors. They they, re they reveal their production version of, of the Air. Tom, accidentally in <laughs> you know on purpose. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> it was accidentally. I I noticed that Lucid sent out a tweet announcing that they were going to be offering the Air in in, in addition to Europe and the U.S. They're going to be offering it in the Middle East. No surprise there because their big investor now is this Saudi <laughs> firm. So. Uh, you know, I kind of expected that they were going to kind of make it available in the Middle East. 
Um, but then looking at the picture, I noticed some subtle differences in the concept car that we've seen so far. Now, Lucid was supposed to reveal the production version at the New York Auto Show back in early April. Um, that show's been postponed, probably going to be canceled. Uh, so Lucid was kind of left hanging. They had put a lot of effort into planning this reveal. I know that because I got multiple emails. I was invited to it and the, the, the party and the reveal before the show. And they had all these events planned to, to kind of do their coming out party. Now, all of a sudden, they're like just hanging like, OK, how, what do we do? How, do? how do we reveal the car? So it seems like they just said, "Ah, oh, you know, to hell with it. Uh, you know, we'll tweet a picture of it, and and uh, that's it." Uh, I, I I haven't gotten any official word from Lucid as far as is this the uh, the production version, but yeah. I have sources um, that confirm to me that yes, that that picture there is the production version. Not okay. a whole lot different. You'll notice yeah. the rear view mirrors are different. The headlights are slightly different. And underneath the front bumper in that grill area, you could see the um, advanced driver assistance system. It's hard to see. I had to, yeah, kind of right where you are there, but I blew it up and lightened it. And you could see there's a big panel there where that houses so, some of the um, ADAS equipment. Um, and uh, that was not present on the uh, concept. So, uh, you know, that, 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 there it is. There's the production Lucid Air. Wow. So I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about this car. It doesn't really, it doesn't stir my heart really, but I mean, it looks like it, the numbers look great. It's supposed to be super efficient, have a long range over 400 miles, I believe. And the, uh, the factory is still under construction. They're building that. I'm not sure what kind of work is going on at the moment, but you know, it's in the process of being built. So it looks like this is going to happen for sure. What do you think, Kyle? You have something? Yeah, I, I actually want to talk about that point. I think a lot of people feel kind of beige on the Lucid, kind of bland. Yeah. Um, uh, Tom and I both have spent time, uh, you know, with, with at the factory. I got to spend a day with their engineering team, and I went from being, okay, Lucid's kind of eh, to, you know, I guess I need to be careful about what I say, but their technology, their efficiency uh, of the vehicle's it, it, that's what got me excited about it. The design is pretty boring. Um, but I think if you look at how they're achieving these numbers and how they're getting these acceleration figures that they've quoted, and uh, it's really, uh, you know, next level stuff from an engineering perspective, something we haven't seen from anyone before. So I thought that is what gets me excited. Mm. Um, and I, I hope other people have that same realization as to, how they're achieving this stuff. And this is like an engineering marvel. Um, right. But I think it'll, you know, I think they have seven models planned in, in near term, something like this. Uh, well, let's get one on the road. Let's get, let's get one out. Yeah. Let's get one. That's exciting. Cause I think the air is a good one to start with uh, when they, you know, reach production, hopefully by early next year. But I yeah. think we need something that, that really gets people excited. As, as uh, Tom said recently on a, on a, one of these podcasts about so many, EV companies that haven't yet got a car on sale they're just putting out renders which is done you know in half a day by a smart kid in college uh, who's pretty good at photoshop so this although it's not out I'm all I'm inclined anyone that's building a factory that has a car that you know something tangible we've done this so many times over and over again your company saying hey we're gonna have an EV and then great but you know you're nothing more than you know four guys in a website so um and a render I'm always inclined with anyone that's actually got something tangible to give them the benefit of the doubt and, uh, and you yeah. know, wish them all the best. And let's just hope and pray that all the stars align and they uh, they, they come out with a you know, great car out of the blocks. But I think it's slightly flying under the radar as well. I think maybe a few people aren't, uh, you know, aware of it yet. Yeah, I think it's going to be... Uh it's going to have to be exciting from behind the wheel because the outside, I mean, it's a little similar to the Faraday Future vehicle. It's like, mm, you know, I really want to get inside and maybe it'll, it'll, it'll change my mind, you know. But anyway, that's we've been doing this for like an hour, so let's wrap this up. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. You can find us uh, on, on YouTube if you're watching us here now course and we're also on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify uh we just got on iheart radio um yeah so join us again next week and uh thanks for thanks for everything and we'll see you then see you guys see ya take care 